It is one of the best known stories that is just woven into the American culture. It's told as part of the kindergarten curriculum. It's driven home in childhood minds with classroom plays where kids wear those cut and paste construction paper pilgrim hats or Indian headdresses. It's underscored with the take-home kids crafts that adorn almost every parent's refrigerator. Turkeys with feathers, which are tracings of a child's fingers. It's told in picture books and Disney movies. We could tell it almost in our sleep, could we not? It's unique Americana, and it sends hordes of us into the grocery stores this week to purchase jellied cranberry sauce, and the story ends the lives of millions of gobblers this year. And it's gonna be served to all our families on Thursday. Ask your children, they will tell you this mythic American story well. A hearty band of English immigrants called pilgrims flee from the tyranny of religious persecution at the hands of the British crown, and an intolerant state church. They sail by accident of storm into Cape Cod Harbor, and they proclaim it as a new Plymouth where freedom and humble worship can flourish as they establish a shining utopian theocratic city on a hill. They work hard, they fight, fight plague and disease, they endure a bitter winter, Graves scatter the landscape, and grief is stoically handled by an unshakable faith that they are doing the will of God. Putting politics to their theology, they write up the Mayflower Compact, a template to avoid arguments and the evils of communal living. Come the following fall of 1621, they reap this incredible, bountiful harvest that is beyond their husbandry skills. And thinking that such an undeserved abundance must be God's blessing on their way of living, they declare a holiday, three days of feasting. And being such a beneficent lot, they invite their neighboring Indian friends to join them so they can gorge themselves silly. And then they sit back to watch the Panthers play the Cowboys in football. <laughs> well, excising the football. That is the story that I got growing up in small town South. The pilgrims were presented as almost this perfect role model, previously persecuted, but graciously beneficent. But, you know, so I was taught to be like them, work hard, I was taught, and then I would be blessed by God. Additionally, as the Puritans were deeply religious, you had to be truly thankful by being deeply religious yourself. Be a Christian. Something implied during those Cold War days that all those godless heathens in the Soviet Union could never be really thankful. And even then, if you wanted the fullness of God's blessing, you needed to be a Sunday school attending, Wednesday night, go to prayer meeting Southern Baptist. Otherwise, you were nothing more than those hedonistic Yankees up there who were partying at the Macy's Thanksgiving Day Parade. <laughs> but we're reminded by that old phrase that the victors write the history. But if you look at that ideal picture painted of the original Thanksgiving and sort of refocused your attention off the pilgrims who normally tell that story to the ones in the background, those Native Americans, what might that story look like from those Native Americans in 1621? Well, last fall, a group of klutzy refugees with a foreign religion who couldn't even drive their own ship got lost and they ended up in our backyard. They showed up totally unprepared for the weather, so a bunch of them ended up sick and frozen. Worse, while they prayed a lot, they didn't actually know how to do anything. So they couldn't farm, they couldn't fish, or really take care of themselves. And they argued a lot. Why anyone would come here ignorant of how to survive in this place is beyond us. We had to show them how to do everything. How to grow corn and fish the rivers and find game, to build shelter, what to use for clothes, 
I mean, some of them did get by that winter, and they were really lucky because the summer was better than usual, and they had a good crop this year. Oh, and we got invited to their big party. But we doubt such dumb folks are going to make it another year without our help. How does that story sound to you? It's easy to make ourselves the center of the story. How seldom do we flip it over and look at it from another side? So today, let's take the flip side of how our culture, rather than our faith, has approached Thursday's celebration. Let's take an old story and try to glean a new perspective. Examine a sacred text and see it with new insight. Do the routine, but still find some fresh meaning. Simply can we refocus our view on Thanksgiving as an experience that may be exceptionally familiar, and yet there's something new in our Thanksgiving to give to God. You know, a Thanksgiving Day was common in most states in the early American Republic, but it wasn't a national holiday until 1863 when Abraham Lincoln, amid the blood-soaked bat uh, battlefield carnage of the Civil War, reminded the nation there was still much for which to hold gratitude for. Over the 152 years since then, much in our mindset has changed as a culture. Oh, the contemporary culture frames Thanksgiving as a noun. Thanksgiving is a day, a day that's based on pilgrims who enjoy an overflowing crop. Brought forward to today, it's sort of a, wow, I should be thankful I've got a lot of stuff. You know, it's gratitude based on our abundance and our success. On Thursday, the vast majority of American parents will sit down before an overflowing table and tell their kids to be grateful for all that they have. They'll talk about the starving kids in Africa who'd be delighted to sit at their ungrateful places around the table, of children who are having to survive destitute lives without a Twitter account or wireless service or an iPhone. We'll talk about Black Friday sales. We'll underscore how blessed we are for all this stuff that makes our life happy and fulfilled, from the flat screen TV to the box DVD sets of friends to foldable selfie sticks. However, those of us who experience the mystery of the presence of an almighty creator, those who claim to follow Jesus and call ourselves Christian, those who stood amid a mystery of grace and love and the one that we worship as Lord, we know that thanksgiving is not a noun. It is a verb. As such, authentic thanksgiving doesn't begin with the pilgrims. It begins with the Almighty. One week we can refocus the familiar is to place the words of the prophet Habakkuk in contrast to that pilgrim story. Habakkuk is a Judean prophet. He lives in a society that is corrupted by the greedy and the power-hungry, who do injustice to the poor and the powerless. The justice system only works for the highest bidder then. A vagrant Moabite would get years in prison for stealing a dollar, but a, a Hebrew embezzling loan shark with the right resources could get himself declared not guilty. Worse, the religious system backs the wealthy and promotes the pious. Those who rig the system over the foreigner, the orphan, and the widows. Habakkuk is a prophet among people who live selfishness on steroids. The upper classes are concerned with getting more, more wealth, more personal pleasure, more personal social power. The elites think of themselves as God's chosen, well-to-do because, well, they've earned what they have because God thinks of them as number one. If people are sick, or poor, or hurting, or social outcast, well, it's because they must have some character flaw, and they deserve what they're getting. Just for the record, sound very different from today? So, as God's prophet, Habakkuk proclaims his society has sown the seeds of its own destruction. A nation built on gluttonous power and pride will fall, and it will morally implode. And as if on cue, a foreign invader comes and Babylonia lays siege to his holy city, Jerusalem. At first, Habakkuk thinks this invasion is God's punishment for the sins of the people. But then he takes a good look at Babylon. 
It's even more immoral, corrupt, greedy, kill them all of the enemy. And he sees them as so evil, he fears they might actually wipe out the remnant of the faithful Hebrews who truly worship God. Tearfully, fearfully, Habakkuk sees that if the Babylonians win, the people will be destitute and the worship of God could actually be obliterated. What he sees would be no different than, say, a, a faithful contemporary Syrian. They see the Assad regime as a brutal dictatorship, but the invading ISIS? They're not liberators. They are a culture so evil, they are going to leave the landscape little more than moral, nuclear, wasteland-like. Such might give you a glimpse of how depressing the situation was for Habakkuk. But during Habakkuk's life, he has profoundly been enveloped by the God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. He tells about how that mystery spoke not only from a burning bush, but had sustained the Hebrews for generations, and it sustained him. He experiences the Lord in its holy temple, and he feels the silent awe that all the world keeps before the Almighty. And because of that holy presence, Habakkuk stares into the abyss of the Babylonian evil, and he says, though the fig tree does not blossom, and there are no fruit on the vine, though the produce of the olive fails, and the fields yield no food, though the flock is cut off from the folk, and there is no herd in the stalls, even then, I will rejoice in the Lord. I will exult in the God of my salvation. You know, we gather today a widely diverse people, yet we worship today because we, like Habakkuk, at some moment have been captured by the holy presence of mercy and love. For some of you, that presence came one night as you stared into the vastness of a starry sky. Perhaps for some of you, it came in that moment where you first held the small, tiny fingers of a newborn child. It may have been witnessing the baptism of someone, someone young professing a newfound faith, or you found it when you broke the bread and sipped from a common cup. The holy may have spoken to your souls when a revivalist started uh, confronting your sin and offering salvation. It may have been in hearing the choir sing with the depth of emotion in sharing some majestic music of faith. I don't know, it could have come from anywhere. Some of you, it may have even occurred sitting around a Passover table and hearing the ancient words of a Seder or in someone sharing a Buddhist meditation. But somehow, somehow, you found the presence of God in that moment. It was real. And we all knew that we mattered to our Creator. And in that moment was all that we needed to feel gratitude, and we whispered, thanks be to God. Like the pilgrims, it is very easy to give thanks when the bounty is better than expected. Likewise, when the table is overflowing with sliced turkey or rolls or beans and peas and stuffing and pumpkin pie, or maybe even that Sears just delivered that big TV in time to watch the game, or that dividend check is warming your wallet, it is not hard at all to give thanks then. What is amazing, perhaps beyond any logic that's found in the formula except in the formula of faith, are those like Habakkuk who give thanks when all they've known lies in ashes and there is nothing to eat but bitter herbs. For me, the miracle of Thanksgiving is not the pilgrim story, but it is on a Thursday when there will be grateful hearts lifted in praise and thanksgiving to God when their world has come to a shattering end. Those folks are like Habakkuk, and they say that even on Monday when the manager told me that the plant is closing and I'm unemployed, and even though the flash flood left my house in ruins and I don't have a FEMA trailer to live in, Though this is the first holiday since the divorce, and Tuesday the call came from the doctor and told me it's cancer, though yesterday I walked away heartbroken from the graveside, yet even in all of that, I will rejoice in the Lord and I will be joyful in the God of my salvation. Now that, that is Thanksgiving born of faith. Look, I'm, 
I am well aware that the past days have been a nightmare, from bombs bringing down airplanes to bombings in Beirut and the terrorist attack in Paris and Mali, Mali and, and a 24-hour news cycle that tells every detail of every threat. We have been overwhelmed by death and given so much anguish. Fear is the central emotion driving our culture right now. Yes, there is evil in the world, and, and it can hurt, and yes, we want security. I have been horrified, though, by the force that fear has demanded, that we lock all the doors, we require religious list, or imply that Muslim refugees are somehow depraved savages out to slaughter us. Are we still, we could ask, the land of the free? How well do we live as a group that claims to be the home of the brave? Habakkuk's world was far worse than ours, and yet he was able to express not fear but faithfulness, not hatred but hope, not worry but worship, an open-hearted thanksgiving to God because he knew in the end all, all of this is in the hands of the Lord. Answer this, why is it over and over again Jesus' statement in Scripture is fear not. Because when we fear, we run from the kingdom of God, the kingdom that he proclaimed in Matthew 23. I was hungry and you gave me something to eat and thirsty and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger and you let me in. Ask yourself, what sounds more like Jesus? The words that you hear from the fear mongers who compare refugees to rabid dogs or think inter internment camps would be a good idea? are the 1883 words of Emma Lazarus that we placed on the Statue of Liberty, not like the brazen giant of Greek fame with conquering limbs astride from land to land. Here at our sea-washed sunset gates shall stand a mighty woman with a torch whose flame is imprisoned lightning and her name the mother of exiles. From her beaconed hand glows worldwide welcome her mild eyes command, command the air-bridged harbor that twin cities frame. Keep ancient lands your storied pomp, cries she with silent lips. Give me your tired, your poor, your huddled masses who yearn to breathe free. The wretched refuse of your teeming shore. Send these, the homeless, tempest-tossed to me because I lift my lamp beside the golden door. Simply ask yourself, how will those fleeing from terror experience God through us enough to be able to say on Thursday, thank God? People of faith, even in the midst of personal crisis or economic collapse or natural disaster or even terrorist threat, they will on Thursday give thanksgiving because of an encounter with the Lord of life, the creator of all things we see in Jesus. And because of that encounter, they simply know God is. And if God has grabbed us, we are not daunted by the troubles of our age, nor are we fearful of whatever is to come. Thanksgiving is not about thanking God for our smarts or our health, nor for, as Deuteronomy admonishes us, the wealth that we have acquired by the strength of our hand. It is to thank God that God is and the divine permeates our lives, that we are gifted with life by God's mercy and treasured by his vast love. We bless God that even if our lives are an emotional toxic dump, we live within his promise to be with us even to that point when time itself shall be no more. So Thursday, I really do hope you have a blast. Stuff yourself on that excellent food. Treasure the joy of family and friends and enjoy the, uh, the friends and the, the games. Go to the movies, doze off on the sofa. Delight in the day. Give thanks for what you have and who you are as God's beloved child. But remember the presence, the holy presence that allows us to refocus from all that familiar. Be as Paul says, rejoice in the Lord always. Rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, 
present your request to God. And then you'll know the peace of God, which transcends all our understanding, and it will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. So Thursday, well, if any day, maybe even today, refocus the familiar Thanksgiving story. Proclaim with faith that though the fig tree does not blossom and the vines and the olive fail and the flocks are run off and there is not even any cattle in the stalls, yet we, we here at First Baptist, we're going to rejoice in the Lord because we will give thanks to the God of our salvation. Amen.